I want to first begin with Professor Yang Chen, who's joining us from Mexico City, who is going to be investigating this mythological and kind of oral um, and folk folklore theory that pinatas began in China. He's investigated that history and um, he's going to be speaking to us today about that as a potential theory, what really exists and examine that possibility. In organizing the Craft in America exhibition on pinatas, we have been amazed at how little documentation there is of the history of these incredibly uh, ubiquitous and important cultural objects globally. And Yang is one of the few who's tried to begin examining this from an academic standpoint. Um, I'm gonna also invite all of you to type your questions into the chat or the Q&A, and then um, all of our speakers will address those towards the end of their presentations. Um, so we will start with Yang. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, thanks to everyone too. Um, okay, uh, today we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, what well, the history, the origin of this tradition, piñata, which is a hugely popular in in Mexico, in and also USA and many other countries. And about the origins, it has always been a sort of a uh, dispute and a mystery dispute because there's no. Um, uh, uh, like conclusive uh, sort of uh, argument about the real beginning of um, history of this uh, long tradition. But at least uh, up to now we, we have uh, at least the four different versions and we have the uh, Italian version uh, or Italian uh, origin of this uh, tradition. We have the Spanish version also, Spanish origin of the tradition. We also have this uh, native uh, Mesoamerican origin, which is also a very um, important uh, discourse. But also we do have another uh, very important discourse about, uh, about the origin of the piñata, which is the Chinese version of Chinese discourse. And um, about all those uh, theories or speculations and, uh, very little research has been done so far. So we, we cannot uh, speak with a sort of a certainty about or oh, in a very authoritative uh, sort of uh, fashion about the real beginning of, of the real origin of this uh, tradition. But uh, based on what I have done so far, I can actually speak a little bit about, uh, about this uh, speculation of the ch possible Chinese origin of this tradition. Um, what I've done is that I, I looked into uh, some of the textual sources, both in Chinese and also in English, Spanish, including a little bit of Italian sources, trying to figure out what is really going on there and uh, how many dots we can actually connect. Because so far we only have several dots out there and there's no sort of um, consistent or convincing sort of a link between a, any of those parts. Yeah, some parts maybe you can find a, a more solid sort of uh, uh, connection, other parts not so much. About this uh, Chinese uh, 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 version of the um, uh, pin, origin of the piñata, what I found is that uh, in, there are a lot of actually Chinese uh, texts uh, where you can find a documentation of some uh, of long tradition China, which is called a Da Chun Yu, hidden the um, earth ox or terra ox, which is actually a very long long tradition China. It can date back to um, like uh, Western Zhou uh, Dynasty, which is actually like more than two thousand years um, and, uh, uh, from our time. Uh, in this book um, called um, the Book of Rights. It's a very ancient book, uh, usually regarded as one of the Confucian classics. In this book, we do find some um, sort of, um, document about this uh, practice, where it says um, in the at the beginning of the spring, the the, the lords of the state, or uh, sometimes even the king himself, they would participate in the ceremony, which would uh, like actually 
uh, signify or symbolize the beginning of spring because China traditionally is a very important uh, country of agriculture and farming is a very important part of the, of the, of the policy of national sort of management. So the Lord would actually uh, perform this ritual to encourage the people, farmers, of course, to uh, dedicate themselves to, to the uh, agrarian production because it's very important to, uh, to, to know when it's the right time. Right? So they, they will have this uh, very important ritual to suggest, okay, uh, spring is here and it's time to get started. We have to start uh, our farming. So this uh, practice, feeding the um, earth ox, was uh, from the very beginning, very importantly uh, installed in the sort of official um, establishment. It was not just a popular practice or folkloric tradition. It was actually a sort of official practice and participated by, by the officials and from very top of the structure, political structure, down to the very bottom of the society. So, so this practice that started in, in the Western Zhou period, like um, uh, several hundred years before the time of Christ. And then later it became a very uh, widespread, uh, 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 like officially established during Han Dynasty, which, is like, which was 200 years before the Christ, before the time of Christ and down to 200 years after the time of Christ. So 400 years of this dynasty. So the practice was already um, uh, very, very popular, very part, uh, participated by officials and also by the common people. So we, we have, uh, in, in addition to this uh, uh, records of um, book of rights, we do also have um, a lot of poems, a lot of poems uh, throughout the history and, and dedicated to the topic of this Da uh, Chenyo uh, tradition. Or like us, we, I have found um, like about a, a, a thousand or so, like uh, for example here, um, I would like to share um, uh, some of the poems with you guys uh, that I would talk about, uh, talk about uh, um, this Da Chenyo tradition. For example, here. Okay, here's one poem by Yuan Zhen from the Tang Dynasty, which was from uh, uh, 600, 608, uh, 18 to 906 time period. So, and then the poem is called Shen Chun, the, the birth of the spring or beginning of the spring. So, and uh, uh, two sentences here. Okay, so translate those. They hit the terror ox outside the door of the government building and the fight to get the earth falling from inside the ox to cover the spring silk worms because they believe the, the, the uh, soil is going to be very good for, for raising silk worms. And also, uh, of course, it's a symbol of, of good luck. Good luck. This is one poem here. And then here we have a, a one, actual one text, very important, from a Song Dynasty. It was actually issued by the Emperor, Emperor Zhen of the Song Dynasty. And he ruled between 1010 to 1063. So this uh, uh, governed um, a text called the Classic of Terra Ox or Classic of Earth Ox, Tu Niu Jing, which actually it gives a very specific regulation um, about um, the practice, the custom, this uh, ritual. And for example, here, if you look at the index or, or, or content here, the first chapter, only four chapters of this class, a very tiny book. And the first chapter is about the color of the terox. So it says, okay, you should use this and that color to decorate your uh, earth ox, terox. This first chapter is about the color. And then you have the second chapter, which is about the dress code of the one uh, or usually the official who is going to heat the hair ox. So there's a very specific regulation of the dress. what kind of dress you should wear and what kind of color you should have on your dress. 
So this is the second chapter. And then the third chapter is about uh, actually the setting, how you're gonna set up the place, okay, where the ritual gonna take place, right? How the size of ox and the surroundings, what kind of decoration you should have for the surroundings. And the, uh, the relative position also, uh, the, the, the official, how far the official should stand away from ox, right? Even including the, the very specific gestures or moves, right? It's about uh, this very specific uh, details about this ritual. And then first chapter is about the, the tool, usually a whip or sometimes a stick. And the official gonna use to hit the ox with. So it's a very specific regulation about the, the tool, the, the stick or the whip. So four chapters about this um, practice, which is a very official issued by the emperor himself. Uh, this is one uh, very uh, important document here. So here I'm gonna share another poem uh, by Yang Wanli from the Song Dynasty, which was about like, uh, 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 well, uh, this uh, poet, Yang Wanli, he lived between uh, 1127 to 1206, right? So here, this poem also is very specific uh, about the uh, doctrinal uh, ritual, he can the spring ox. First line, okay, a boy with a whip in hand, hitting mud ox, emulating uh, elders, hitting the, hitting the spring, he starts with heat in the head. A yellow ox with the yellow hooves and the two white horns. The herd boy wearing green raincoat grass and a hand of bamboo leaves. This year seems to be rainy and fertile. A lot more joy and happiness than last year. A year for good harvest. Kids are joyful for not suffering hunger. Oxen are worried for not being fattened enough. Ears of wheat full of horizon so much so that the clouds look like brooms. Rice grains are like pearls, filling up buckets after bucket. After tilling the fields, the yellow ox have to till the hills until when they can get a moment of rest. This is another poem from the Song Dynasty. Okay, so here we have um, like uh, uh, some uh, images some images. Uh, the first one, this one we have here, it's a, a drawing of this ritual, Da Chen Yu ritual. You can see here, it's a, it's a um, terra ox, earth ox, and uh, covered with a piece of red um, paper or red fabric. And on the fabric, you can see the character Chun, which means the spring, spring. And also a huge paper flower on the head of the ox. And the guy uh, just in traditional gown uh, and uh, whipping and uh, whipping ox from behind. So, uh, like, as it means it's awakening of the springtime, and it's time to get um, uh, to get to work farming, right? Farming for the farmers. And here we have another image here, uh, which is um, a traditional illustration of the Dachenio. You can hear, and a lot of people. Uh, a gathering and then with this ox in the middle. And uh, it might be a real ox here actually instead of a uh, temple ox. But uh, what, it, what it says is uh, still the ritual, the, uh, the, the beginning of the springtime. And you can see a young guy uh, standing behind the ox with a stick or whip in his hand. And it's obviously it's a very symbolic move. Symbolic move. And you can also several guys standing in front of us. And then on the right corner there, you can see one guy dressed in official gown with a hand there and, and also with a score in his hand. And, uh, and it, it usually means a sort of um, a god of a fortune or something like that. So it's a combination uh, of a realistic description of the, of the time also with some sort of um, uh, supernatural sort of element there. Uh, it's it's uh, very much a folkloric uh, um, art craft, art craft here. Here we have another, another image, which is a photo taken in the early 20th century, probably in the first year, during the first year of the 20th century, very early, and from the Sichuan province. Sichuan province. You can see here, 
uh, the practice is still pretty much alive, pretty much alive. We, you can see here is a, it's Earth Arts here, and uh, even with a uh, with a uh, uh, young boy, uh, of course, it's a uh, uh, also it's a uh, it's, uh, uh, art craft with paper and earth made of. Okay, so you can see people uh, are gathering around watching watching the um, ritual, watching the practice. This one here, um, I'm going to share a few more images here, which is um, the first uh, is the paper cart. You can see paper cart with arts in the middle. And there is a lot of a lot of um, images here, and then the guy with the whip, stand stand behind. So obviously, it's a um, heat heating the spin ox it's ritual here. And then you have another image here with um with the ox sort of receiving offerings from 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 people. Obviously, you have the um, sacrificial table here. There's a lot of uh, uh, offerings, and then you have you see the image on the on the left, which is um. Uh, Usually, a uh, uh, god or deity for fortune. So it's also a very much a folkloric presentation. And then here you have another one, which um, ox in the middle still. And then the two Chinese characters at the bottom uh, says um, uh, like a feng deng. It's like harvest, good harvest. So you can say it's a harvest time. And then on, on, on the top of the image, you see. Um, to another two character which means five grains, uh, 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 like rice, like wheat, and uh, millet, for example. Five grains means a good harvest. And then here you have another join, which is from uh, Ming Dynasty, like uh, 1368 to 1644. It's traditional join here. You can see uh, the magistrate or governor of a place, prefectural county. For sure, is actually um, participating in the ritual. He himself uh, having a uh, uh, whip in his hand, trying to uh, trying to hit the the earth ox here, which is uh, staged on, on top of the table. And the, another young boy standing in front of ox with a squirrel in his hand. And the character there in the squirrel is uh, is Chun Spring. Okay, it's uh, very much. Uh, um, official ritual and also popular ritual um, for the beginning of the spring and also beginning cycle of the production season. So also we have uh, our practice um, uh, here still alive there in Henan province nation country. But uh, of course, it very likely was, uh, it is a resurrected practice because um, all these kind of practice or tradition were interrupted for several decades. Uh, for, for political reasons, for um, ideological reasons. And then in uh, uh, the recent two decades, for example, we do see a lot of uh, sort of uh, restoration of traditional uh, practices, uh, rituals, customs, for example. Here in Henan province, Neixiang County, we, we see this resurrected practice. What is it here is um, a paper ox here, actually, on the left. Is the uh, five of the different colors, and then two guys dressed up in a sort of uh, tr a traditional official gowns, representing uh, sort of the um, governors or some sort of official of the government. And the, on the very top of the building, and you can see characters, uh, which says, uh, which say, uh, the the um the government hall of Neixiang County, okay. the government hall of Neixiang County. And then you can see the, the official with a red sword in his hand, trying to uh, uh, make uh, his announcement. Okay. And then on the right, you can see the right paper, uh, uh, like a oh, red paper with the character Chun, right? okay, uh, written there. So and a very, very sort of, um, sort of uh, ritualistic uh, presentation of an old tradition, of course. And then you can see what you can see here. It's um, okay, the official, probably the governor or magistrate, uh, uh, like uh, uh, using his um, stick to, to hit the ox, to hit the ox. Okay, so it's a ritual in process, ritual in process. And uh, here is another, another uh, image here. And then you can see here, the people are laughing, right? They are very happy. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of performance, especially. Nowadays, many of the uh, 
traditional practices, performance uh, for uh, tourist reasons, right? It's a, it's a huge, um, huge um, tourist attraction for many places. Uh, people come here to watch the performance, the rituals, the customs. So that's why many of the um, customs are sort of resurrections. resurrections. Here you see another photo here, another image here, and uh, another one not so um, clear. Okay, you, what is, you can see here is um, uh, the grains or, or, or nuts or fruits or whatever are leaking from the belly of the ox, which is actually this photo is from uh, this, another time. And then, and then the young people um, around, they are ready to jump in to, to grab some of the goodies, some of the goodies, of course. And then here we have another photo, which is uh, a rich of Da Chun of course, and in Taiwan, uh, winning country. What you can see here, also the local officials, they are participating in this ritual and uh, with, a, with a stick in their hand, each of them. And then here the ox is not paper, uh, not uh, uh, like a pair, not a, uh, Earth is made of stores, stores like rice stores, probably. And you can see, but uh, the the meaning is the same. The meaning is the same. It's a it's a um, um, like symbol of uh, of uh, of uh, of a uh, uh, production season, like agrarian production, of course, farming season, beginning of a farming season. Okay, so this is the uh, um, this is the image here. Um, probably uh, because of the time, limited time, probably I should stop here, should stop here. And the, so we can have a little bit of time for questions or comments, okay? Perfect. So, all right. Perfect, thank uh, you. Thank you. Okay. thank you so much, Yang. Thank for, you very much. For, for providing that insight into the, the Chinese parallels. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question about scale, which I think um, mm -hmm. was indicated by some of the images. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you just briefly talk a little bit about uh, what really how there's so little out there in terms of documentation of this mm -hmm. tradition and what you what you actually did find, just in brief? Uh, like uh, like uh, uh, sources of um, uh, uh, like other languages, like uh, the general scholarship of this. Okay, well, actually, um, well, like a, a few years back, what? Well, until a few years back, I had no idea about this, uh, like origin of this tradition. And then I, it was actually my father-in-law who used to be a journalist and who, who actually informed me and he told me, okay, you know, Pinata is originally from China. I was so surprised. How come it has not to do that? I, 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 Mexican, correct? Uh, Mexican, yes. My father-in-law, Mexican, uh, used to be a journalist writer. And then it was, I was so surprised. How can it be? Because uh, I, 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 I was completely hit with a surprise. And, and then I started uh, some digging. And, uh, and of course, I started with uh, Wikipedia, uh, Spanish, the English version. Uh, what I found there is uh, very, very little information, actually. And then, and then the resources that they used are uh, uh, sort of um, from online articles. And you can actually retrieve those articles. But the, the problem is that those sources are like a, Almost nothing has used any sort of reliable uh, textual source. They don't have uh, citations from anywhere. Well, uh, some of them have very, uh, very little citation. And, and then I, 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 I like continue my digging and I, until I found uh, some printed version, uh, printed articles, like at least three printed articles. And but they are very short articles. It's like um, uh, like an encyclopedia entry style, very short. And those entries, they, they don't have uh, citations themselves. So I, I found the article for Wickman, I found the article for Foster, and a, an article for another person. And then sometimes they cite each other, they, they cite each other. And then if you go further from there, you, you, you just, uh, you just uh, find them not, you cannot, it's like a sort of, sort of uh, like, a, Cyclical or like it's like a mutual citation, mutual citation in some sense. So um, and then meanwhile, and a lot of uh, Mexican uh, Mexican writers, uh, big authors, small-time uh, writers, they wrote a lot of articles, uh, short articles mostly, 
And then many of them claim the Chinese origin of this Inyana tradition. But the, the same problem is there that they not that has any sort of citation. So I was, but sometimes they have very uh, detailed uh, description of this um, Chinese uh, practice. Okay, this Chinese practice, they have this box with colors and you have um, uh, uh, like, a, uh, like a different uh, uh, goods and, and uh, seeds and inside the bedding. And then uh, the people would, uh, would uh, swarm to, to grab hold of uh, for, uh, sort of the, the goodies they came from the bedding. A very detailed description. I, I was just wondering, okay, they might have some, there, there might have some sort of um, source out there. So, uh, and then some of them uh, do mention Marco Polo and they say, okay, Marco Polo mentioned this in his book. And then uh, he also actually brought this uh, practice tradition from China and to Italy. And so I, I also did a, a, a little bit of digging in the book of Marco Polo in several different versions. But uh, I, what I found is actually very limited information. So I, I, I didn't find those words like ox or, or cow or, 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 or piñata, those keywords. I, I, I did find none of those actually in his book. But I do find the two chapters, very interesting chapters mixed over though. One chapter is about uh, his own, uh, like, uh, uh, like a, a witness of uh, this uh, practice in, in the imperial court of um, um, Kublai Khan, I believe Kublai Khan, and it's about this celebration of a spring festival, and uh, the, a lot of a lot of uh, activities, a lot of people gathering, and the, and the color even color, but uh, there's no uh, respect and mention of this um, hidden arts practice yet. Uh, this one thing here, he did witness the celebration of the Spring Festival. One second chapter I found in the book of Marco Polo is about his uh, travel to Java, Indonesia, Sumatra, Java. And he found a uh, very interesting tropical plants there, tropical trees. And he, he was, I'm sure he was a very uh, 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 big collector of those species. So he actually brought some of the uh, seeds, the seeds of the one uh, specific plant, tropical plant, tropical tree, back to Italy, and he planted the seeds in, in Venice. But anyhow, because of the weather there, of course, obviously very cold, well, cold, much colder than the weather of Indonesia, Java. So the, the seeds actually didn't grow. So this is a very interesting um, uh, piece or paragraph about his activity in other uh, places. So I just found those two chapters very interesting. And then, but uh, still there's so much more to be done uh, before you can actually con connect some of the dots there. So, but what I, I, I feel is that um, there is something very interesting in, in Italy, obviously, and because in the time of Marco Polo or, or something afterwards, uh, there is also uh, like a documentation about this practice that they call the Big Nada. Same pronounce of, uh, of white dove, like a pottery made of uh, in the shape of a white dove or pigeon. In the San Marco uh, Square of Venice, they would uh, uh, use a, a rope to hand uh, uh, clay uh, white dove, and then people would hit the dove with sticks. And there's some description about this practice, and probably it's not there anymore. So there are some thoughts out there. And then later, the uh, practice was uh, like brought to Spain. And then uh, Spanish conquerors brought the practice to, to uh, uh, the America continent. And then it was close associated with um, a, a Christian, a Christianity, a Catholicism, for example, Lent and of Guaresma. Guaresma and, then, and then in Spain, they still call um, Guaresma as um, uh, um, Piñada Sunday. Okay, Domingo de Viñada Argo. So in the language, this phrase is still there, present there, suggesting there was a tradition there. But before this white dove, Viñada, uh, and uh, uh, the book of, uh, between this white dove and the book of uh, Marco Polo, and there's so uh, vast uh, space for, for people, for Spanish, for everybody to get into, actually to, uh, to, uh, to bridge, to bridge if it's a possibility. Okay, so uh, probably I should have stopped here. And, uh, uh, yes, you have to okay. leave us today, but uh, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so much for initiating.
this mm -hmm. and yes, in revealing how much there is possibilities of, of research here for historians, anthropologists, um, yes. artists, historians, folklorists, um, all to investigate. So thank you so much. Um, I also you. want to note the behind me, the, um, the traditional burro that- <laughs> Yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> bring off. Um, okay you spoke about and and also just to clarify and um i see a question yes we will share links to your paper on okay. Okay. and i also just want to mention to everybody that you are a religious studies um uh, professor uh confucian specifically and uh, that pinatas are not your your core focus but <laughs> um, yes. that this intersection of cultural tradition is very yes. that you, you okay so okay thank you thank you thank you Thank you. See you guys later. Okay. So next, we will be hearing from Justin Favela. Justin is one of the artists participating in our exhibition. Justin's joining us from Las Vegas, I believe, today, um, where you're based. And passing on to you. Thank you so much, Justin. And we are, we are shifting gears a bit here in terms of <laughs> origins to how you use historical precedent in your artwork um, in a number of ways and also getting a little glimpse overall of, of your work as a whole. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm going to share a little mini artist talk here. Hope you can all see it okay. All right, so um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, Thank you, Emily, for having me, and thank you. And, and just a big shout out to all the artists in the show. I know that as artists that use pinata as a medium, a lot of people send me so much work saying like, hey, look what everybody's doing um, with the same materials, which is really awesome that there's finally kind of this big show with a lot of us represented. Um, so, uh, and, and to be in a show with some of the people that I really admire is really amazing. So I just wanted to say that. Um, but let me get into my art practice a little bit. I'll give you a little bit of background and then show you a couple of projects that I've worked on in the past few years. So um, yeah, as Emily said, I am from Las Vegas and Las Vegas is a big influence in my work. Um, and uh, just the visual culture here is very unique. And um, I think just growing up here, it's really influenced my work. Uh, for example, you know, buildings like this, Caesar's Palace, um, which is just like so an exaggerated version of these art historical buildings that I learned about in art school. Um, and then also like uh, places like the Luxor, which are also referencing these like big, important monuments, uh, but also being very disrespectful, racist and appropriating cultures. Uh, you know, for capital gain, which is what Las Vegas does the best. Here's the Venetian. Uh, I really love the Venetian because it was one of the first casinos to really lean into the interior, uh, this interior fantasy on the inside. Uh, they brought the facade inside, which is, uh, which is like a new level of Vegas because everything in Vegas is about the facade. Our facade is our reality, which is a big influence uh, that that topic is a big influence in my work or that theme, I should say. Um, but just to give you a little background, when I grew up in Vegas, I was born in the 80s. This is what the Las Vegas Strip looked like. The big difference from the first photo I showed you at the beginning. And um, neon signs, really, they were the first sculptures that I fell in love with as a kid. They're my big inspiration when I first started making artwork in art school. And I was really looking at signs like the Stardust sign. Um, I would drive by this all the time. My grandmother actually worked next door at uh, the Dunes Casino at the time, which is now the Bellagio. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, but uh, this sign, I was always dazzled by it just because it was the big atomic cloud with all these twinkling stars at night. And so when I was in art school and I started to be challenged to really make work about myself and about my identity, um, which I realized uh, was going to kind of be a challenge as a person of color in the art world. Uh, I know a lot of the people in the show know that 
uh, the art world is obsessed with our biography and our tragedy and our trauma. <laughs> so making work very personal is something that's really pushed on us. But I, I wanted to make sure to talk about Las Vegas and talk about if I was going to get personal, I was really going to make art a, that was about me and my family. Right. So um, I started to, to think about the neon signs and how I could customize them to make them uh, my own. And so that's that's when I first started uh, to make these big cardboard sculptures. Uh, this is the piece Estardas, which I made in honor of my grandmother um, because she that's how she says Stardust, Estardas. And so this is when I really started to think about the underrepresentation of the Latino community in Las Vegas, specifically the people maintaining the casinos on the strip and building these casinos on the strip. Um, and <clears throat> I was really kind of focusing my energy on those, uh, you know, those, those topics. And, uh, and at the same time, I was going to art school and, and going to art history classes and learning uh, about um, a lot of different artwork that I really didn't pay much attention to. Um, so uh, at the time on the Las Vegas Strip, there was also this big property called City Center. And at City Center, uh, they spent millions and millions of dollars on a fine art collection. And so as art students, we were able to go down to the Strip to see, uh, you know, according to MGM International, uh, one of the best art collections that's really come to Vegas. And so one of the pieces here, for example, just to show you what kind of stuff they had, uh, was a big marble sculpture by the British artist Henry Moore. And so uh, this big sculpture sitting outside of the Aria and in front of the lobby, one of the big hotel and casinos on that property. And really, I thought, uh, that it was interesting the way that, that a lot of the art people were marketing city center, like we're gonna show your city uh, what culture is. And that's kind of the battle we have here as Las Vegas artists is proving ourselves to be a town that is that has a lot of creative people that are artists that are amazing, right? So um, I wanted to comment on this. And at the time I had one of my first solo shows at the Clark County Government Center. And after making neon cardboard signs for a while, um, I started to use that neon sign aesthetic as a way to make my work. And I made my own version of uh, a lot of the pieces at City Center, but specifically this Henry Moore piece, I made to scale in cardboard and also in the same kind of visual language as a neon sign, just flattened it out and made it in panels. Um, and that's when I really started to dig into um, a lot of the a lot of the art movements, uh, you know, in the 20th century, in the mid-century, um, and <clears throat> minimalism um, was something that really shocked me when I learned about it initially, um, and how like these white men, you know, could get away with making this art, right? And so it really, it really affected me, and I really wanted to respond to it. And so this is a piece, for example, this is a piece by Carl Andre called Floor Piece. I think this one's at the MoMA and, it, and uh, in New York. And so uh, I wanted to respond to it kind of tongue in cheek uh, with my own version of this piece. So I made this piece called Floor Sombrero, right? Floor Sombrero is like uh, a, uh, a very multi-layered piece where I wanted to make a piece that sat on the ground so that you were aware of the space in the same way that the minimalist artists thought about their work. Um, but I also wanted to give it more meaning than just that. And so I was thinking of symbols of Latinidad at this point in my work because so many professors and people were pushing me to make art about my identity. Uh, I thought, all right, I'm really gonna go over the top and use these really stereotypical symbols of Latinidad and uh, really kind of exploit it. And so I was really confused at the time. <laughs> also, just to let y'all know, um, kind of like giving people what they wanted, but doing it so over the top that, or, or, or so tongue in cheek that they wouldn't know it was a joke, but come to find out, nobody really thought it was a joke. And so, <laughs> 
um, it, but but it really it really ended up working um, as far as the way that my artwork developed. So this piece, for example, might just look like a regular sombrero sitting on the ground, but I really wanted to kind of reclaim this symbol as a symbol of Latinidad. So this whole thing was coated in gesso over and over again, so it almost looks ceramic. And then I painted the exact same design on top of it to kind of claim this as my own object, right? And then put it on the ground so people could interact with it uh, in the gallery. And then I started looking at so much other work like this, uh, you know, this is probably by Donald Judd, big silver cube. Um, and since <clears throat> uh, it was around Christmas time and my Guatemalan side of the family, I'm half Mexican, half Guatemalan. My Guatemalan side of the family always makes tamales around Christmas and it was around Christmas. And so I made my own uh, version of Guatemalan tamales with cement and made these big, made this big cube of 1,095 tamales, which is the amount of tamales, uh, this is the number of tamales uh, uh, that it would take um, if you ate one tamal per meal every day of the year basically. And so stacked in this cube. Um, this is a piece by Richard Serra. It's called Stacks. And so, um, you know, these pieces are really huge and you can kind of walk through them and they really interrupt space. Um, and so I started making giant Doritos uh, that you had to kind of walk around in the gallery. And so um, I was really uh, kind of spoofing these artworks are really taking um, inspiration from them uh, for a while. And then I started to think about the representation of Latinidad um, in the United States specifically with symbols like Doritos that were really American, um, but have you know their origins, at least aesthetically or historically in Mexico and, and other places in Latin America. Um, so then I really started to think about uh, symbols of Latinidad. And like I said, I was kind of going for obvious symbols and the piñata was the most obvious symbol for me. And back in like 2007, when I was doing this work and you Googled piñata, this was the first uh, image that came up on Google images. Um, so the first piñata I ever made was, uh, was a replica of this donkey piñata, um, but I made it actually to scale. Um, and uh, this piñata I thought would be like a, a way, a nice way to wrap up all this kind of research on appropriation and stuff that I was doing. And I thought, all right, I'm gonna make my cheesy piñata piece, <laughs> get it out of the way. Also make like my sad boy art school piece. Um, and you know, that was over 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, here I am still making piñatas today. Um, so this piece was really, uh, really, really pivotal in like my art career after making this and making it, you know, life size. I, you know, I recognized that scale was important. And uh, I kind of wanted to push this a little further. So I, start, I kept making these piñata objects and learning more and more about uh, the history of these objects, which uh, um, like you, we just learned about have some origins in China, not only, uh, you know, the, the, the effigies and the ox, uh, the, the, the oxen that we were talking about, but also the materials uh, you know, papel china, we even call it papel china in Mexico. Uh, and, you know, fireworks are a big part of Mexican culture. And of course, that all came uh, from China through through uh, the trade routes. And anyway, so um, at this point, I just really started looking at symbols of like Latinidad and also like Chicano symbols. Um, and I stayed away from doing work that was specifically Chicano because, you know, that's a very specific identity you know, second, third generation Mexican-American. I'm Guatemalan and Mexican, so I never really felt welcome in that community or not, I, I don't wanna say welcome, but I didn't, I didn't wanna feel like I was appropriating something that wasn't my culture. Uh, but at the same time, I was thinking about the low rider and car culture in general as something um, that's very similar to the piñata in the sense, or low rider culture in the sense of 
um, this, uh, the performance of masculinity within Latinidad and a lot of different cultures. So um, uh, I kind of, I, you know, growing up, I actually didn't really like pinata time because I always felt like it was a performance of masculinity and violence in front of everybody, you know? Um, of course, I didn't have the words to express that wasn't when I was a kid, so I would just hide under the candy table. Um, but uh, when it comes to car culture, I kind of have those same feelings around it. So I really wanted to jump in and really start investigating it. And one of the first cars that I fell in love with was the Gypsy Rose, uh, made in the Gypsy Rose originally in 1964 Chevy Impala. In the 1970s, a family in East LA uh, uh, turned it into this beautiful, most famous car in the world. Um, and in, a few years ago, I was given the opportunity to celebrate this car at the Peterson Automotive Museum. And I made a replica of the Gypsy Rose. And so learning about lowrider culture and, you know, this car to me really was celebrating the people behind the scenes, the queer folks in lowrider culture that nobody really talks about. Also the women behind the scenes, a lot of the women artists in, in the culture or, or the, or, you know, the women and families holding it down so that the men could have these hobbies are also as important uh, in, in these traditions uh, that are really important to to Latinx culture, but specifically, uh, you know, Chicano lowrider culture, you know, to take the symbol of American progress, which is the car and make it into this just unmatched work of art is, is really says a lot about, you know, our resilience and the importance of our culture in this country. Um, so the lowrider has become one of my favorite uh, objects to make and, and, and symbols to really to talk about. Okay, so I, I really, <clears throat> at this point, I think I really, I realized in my art career that uh, I was tired of like giving people what they wanted. And I really wanted to start researching my own history and looking at my own art history. And at this point, I was kind of pinata out, like making the objects as piñatas. And I started to think of the piñata more as a medium and not just a material or an object. And so, at that, same, at that very same time, I also met an art historian, Dr. Emanuel Ortega, who I had a podcast with for many years. And um, I started, I, I took his art history class at UNLV. It was offered after I graduated. And I started learning about Jose Maria Velasco, which it was a very prolific painter in the 19th century, landscape painter, uh, 19th century Mexico, his work was really the symbols of the nation. And the more you look at his work, uh, the more you realize that uh, it's kind of this romanticized uh, European version of Mexico because uh, Velasco learned from European masters in Europe. Uh, the style he uses looks just like kind of like a German painting, a little bit of Italian painting, right? So like, uh, but, but his paintings were just so famous. So looking at these paintings in person, I did this residency in Mexico. Uh, I realized that I wanted to express kind of like the commodification or, or romanticization of, of Mexican culture through piñata because I kind of saw piñata as like a, as a medium that kind of expresses popular art because everybody knows what a piñata is and what it's used for. So it's about celebration, it's about destruction. So then I started to make these uh, paintings, uh, one of them which is in the show right now um, uh, of you know almost these like replicas with the colors of tissue paper that I had collected over the years. Uh, this is another Velasco painting, El Valle de México, desde, desde, Visto desde Santa Isabel, El Cerro de Santa Isabel. And so you can see uh, Mexico City being, uh, you know, the lake uh, being filled in there and the beginnings of Mexico City. And here is uh, the piñata version of that. Now, uh, I'm running low on time, so I'm just going to go past these really quick. But this eventually moved over to making these big murals. And these big murals, uh, uh, I started to collage landscape paintings um, and make these big kind of installations. This was at the Denver Art Museum for an exhibition called Mi Tierra, uh, Contemporary Artist Explore Place. 
Um, and I covered the walls in Velasco paintings. And again, still thinking about these icons and symbols of Latinidad. I had never touched Frida because I, I thought it was just gonna be too, too easy, too cheesy, you know? But I said, whatever, I'm already making work with piñatas. Let's really lean into this. And a lot of the things that I mentioned about Velasco uh, were really magnified by Frida's work, right? This exotization of Mexican culture, you know, giving the white folks what they want, creating this fantasy, which still is happening today. I just saw a commercial for the newest Disney movie. It's called Encanto. I'm like, do we have to be dead or magical to be in a Disney movie? Can we just be alive and Latino? Is that possible? Anyway, uh, all of this was started, a lot of, the, you know, like Frida uh, is part of that history of the representation of Latinos in media, right? So I thought that was very important to kind of add that element to um uh to, uh, uh to this uh, installation that i'm showing you right now so i was looking at frida's work but what really interested me was the media representation was this popular representation of frida so i was looking at the movie frida actually starring salma hayek and i really was paying attention to these uh, these scenes at the beginning and at the end of the movie based in the Casa Azul in her garden that um, kind of reminds me of the Luxor in Vegas, right? You got all these exotic animals and then you have all these uh, uh, artifacts that are kind of just used as lawn decorations, a lot of them from West Mexico that were grave robbed. And so creating again, this fantasy. Uh, and so the exhibition, was called Frida Landia, and uh, it was kind of this immersive uh, exhibition that you could walk through and kind of be in this environment. And so uh, from this point on, I started to make a lot of these very ephemeral, big pinata installations in institutions like museums. Um, but let me just give you a little tour of this one. And of course, I added a, a image of the Virgen de Guadalupe because, you know, She's uh, Frida's uh, Frida and the Virgen de Guadalupe are the two most replicated images in Mexico. All right, and then that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, for this very encapsulated version of of your work, which um, is incredible, of course brilliant how you layer so much historical perspective and art historical uh, references. Um, yes, I, in terms of, of range of history, era, time, um, all into your work. And then this um, examination of pinatas as an artistic medium that has hundreds of years of history. That's ultimately what we're looking at today, which maybe someday if we can find a way to document will be more recognized as a valid cultural medium. Um, let's see, we are running a little late. Thank you all. Um, I think we should move to Roberto. Uh, and I do wanna mention for anyone who is not able to stick with us um, that this is being recorded and you can always revisit once we post the recording um, within the next few days on our website. Justin and Roberto will address questions at the end and I'm, um, and I'm seeing a few popping up in the chat right now. So we will come back and revisit those. Hi, Roberto. Thank you so much. I am going Okay, to audio's on now. Hello. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. I just want to reiterate and echo what Justin said. You know, I'm very thankful to Craft America for pulling all of these pinata artists together. Some I've never heard of. Um, so a big thank you to you. And um, thank you, Justin. That was, that was great listening to you to you talk about your work. Um, so I guess I'll just jump into it. So first, I'm just gonna uh, start by answering a question. The most popular question I'm asked is why the pinata? Why are you working in pinata? So the simple answer is I just stumbled upon it. So I, I had been working in bronze and I was uh, a little frustrated because I was, I, I would call it financially separated from my practice. I was no longer going to school. So um, it was very difficult to get stuff cast in bronze. Um, I didn't have the space, I didn't have the money. Um, so I just stumbled upon um, the pinata, a pinata one day. And it's actually, uh, I remember the site, it's pinataboy.com if you wanna go take a look. And this is a, a person who 
uh, makes pinatas for his kids. So the pinata I saw was a zebra pinata, but there was something about the way that he rendered the form. Where I was like, oh, like this is sculpture. I can I can go this route. And you know, I was familiar with pinata from childhood, um, but there was something comforting to me about the idea of moving into a form that I couldn't be separated from financially. Um, you know, it's very inexpensive to work in the pinata, so that's why that's why I went into it. Um, but why I stayed is because. Uh, as Justin mentioned, I think that the um, Mexican representation in fine art is limited. Um, I would say they've been historically excluded at best underrepresented. Um, so I think that there is an importance to uh, move the pinata into the fine art realm. Um, in addition, I think the Mexican people in America are not appreciated. Uh, I think they're viewed as uh, disposable, both with labor, they expect cheap food, cheap crafts, and I kind of want to shift that, or I hope that our work um, informs people to shift their way of thinking to give value um, to the culture and the people. But that being said, so let's just jump into the work. So the first project I worked on was uh, were sugar skulls. Um, I wanted to do something simple, um, form-wise, and just so I could explore materials, because I didn't even know if this is something that I wanted to do. Um, I made one skull, sugar skull pinata. A friend of my husband saw it, her boyfriend at the time saw it, and um, she decided to give me an online show. So that's what got me headlong into this form. Um, and I really got to explore the material. And this, the, this technique is very different from what I do now. This is um, from that website, pinataboy.com. It was just a technique that he used and I was just experimenting. Um, I didn't really like this technique. Um, it was hard on my hands and I didn't like that I couldn't get clean lines. Um, so I started to play and shift um, with the fringe. Um, so the next slide is where I jumped into pinata paintings. Um, initially, I wanted to start with Bosch. So Hieronymus Bosch's painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights, I was fascinated with. Um, and I thought, you know, if I wanted a pinata, I wanted something that I thought was interesting. So that was the idea of going that direction. But I'm also hesitant to jump in um, when I really, really like a project I want to practice. So I knew that I was going to try and incorporate this painterly look of the um, creature. Um, I wanted that to translate to the fringe. So I wanted to um, experiment with a uh, layering of colors and kind of treating it like um, paint. Uh, if you've ever taken a painting class, they'll make you do a swatch book where you take uh, colors and then tint it um, or shade it with white, black and other colors to see um, how your color will shift when it's mixed. So that was the idea behind this uh, series. So I call these Pinyothkos. It's a, it's a humorous take on Rothko uh, and his colorful paintings. And it was a way for me just to um, blend and mix colors and kind of see what they do. Uh, while at the same time, it's not only a exercise, it's also uh, building a body of work. So I slowly shifted over into what you're looking at now are landscapes. Um, I really got into the painting, even though it was quite tedious. Um, I really just liked exploring um, blending colors and uh, playing with technique. So as you can see here, that's the source image there. It's a photograph by my husband. And this is the fringe, the way I make it. I kind of uh, glue them in strips and then cut them, or I might cut them first and then offset them if I want more color to show. And then the next slide will show you um, what the finished piece looks like. So it's, it's somewhat um, abstract. It's not um, clean lined. It's not necessarily trying to be, um, it's just more playing with color and the technique and um, being a little more loose with it. But over time, if you go to the next slide, I did start to get a little more detailed. So this is a more recent painting. It was used uh, for a uh, bus poster here in Los Angeles for my neighborhood. And it's a scene from the neighborhood. But you can see anything man-made, it's very clean lined, um, sharp lines, more graphic. Um, and everything else that's natural is um, more abstract and more painterly. Um, so that was my approach um, with that. Um, and then I, once I felt comfortable, I went back to Bosch. So that's the next slide. Um, so this is the very first Bosch piece I made and it was the inspiration that started it all. Um, and I don't know if you can really see, but if you look at the body, like that's supposed to be looking more like um, 
a painterly flow of color and not necessarily blocky. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to do with these paintings or with these things as I extracted them is I wanted people to realize or not second guess that they're pinatas. So I try to incorporate the pinata motif when I can. And uh, this was the first one I came up with. So uh, I just, in the source material, the bird is just piercing a berry. So I just changed the berry to a star pinata. And you can tell this is one of the earlier ones because you can see those florets on the star pinata ball. Uh, I don't use those anymore, uh, but I probably used them and didn't want to waste them. So I just incorporated them into that one. Um, and then with the next slide, um, this is where I wanted to show you more my technique um, and my approach to translating these images to, um, to pinatas. So I really like, um, humorously playing with it. So um, if you look at the source image, you can tell I didn't try to refine it. I really try to keep my pinatas looking like pinatas. It's more the fringe work that really gets more complex. And what I, what I did and what my decision was with these animals was, you can see that there's like um, highlights and shadows on the original piece. And I translated that to coat pattern and just, um, applied it symmetrically. So it's basically just the pattern of the pelt of the, um, of the creature. Um, and it just makes it more dynamic, I think, um, and more referential to the source. Um, and with the next slide, I'm trying to think of it. Oh, so this is another one, again, just demonstrating, pushing that uh, pinata motif. Uh, this is also still in Bosch. And this is a star pinata, but instead of the pointy uh, star ends, I, uh, did it with um, pomegranate ends. I mean, that was just more to play with the mythology of the pomegranate um, and incorporating that into this. And one thing I, I will say that I really enjoy about using Bosch as a source is um, the pinata is in contemporary America, like distinctly Mexican. And I like the idea of blending that Mexican craft with the Western uh, imagery um, being mixed race. I felt like it kind of, um, represented me in a way. Um, I just didn't mention that, so I wanted to throw that in there. Um, and this is, these next four slides are just uh, an installation of my Bosch pinatas at UCSB. Elise Gonzalez uh, curated this show. And um, I mean, it was great working with a team installing and having a designer design the layout and the colors. Um, so it was really nice to see uh, the magic they brought um, to the installation. But in my research with Bosch, I stumbled upon um, illuminated manuscript creatures. And again, um, it also uh, played with that mixed race uh, theme for myself that, that I like within my work. Um, but as you can see, this is less painterly um, with uh, illuminated manuscripts, it is more graphic. So it was, a, it was a bit of a shift in terms of how I fringe. Um, but there's still also this, um, so they didn't touch upon this uh, uh, in the first talk, but my understanding with the pinata that we know today, especially the star pinata, it was introduced by missionaries. So uh, it was used as a conversion tool. There was a Mesoamerican um, tradition that was similar to the pinata and missionaries saw that and created the star pinata as a teaching, um, as a teaching uh, mechanism to teach uh, religion and convert. So there's something also about the underlying religious uh, themes of Bosch's painting, the Garden of Earth of Delights, as well as medieval manuscripts that I, I kind of like that layer as well. Um, and then the next slide, it just further shows the incorporation of the pinata motif. And one of the reasons that I actually do this is because people have a resistance uh, to accept these as pinatas. It's all pinata technique and that's what I derive it from, so it is. So I kind of help the audience along by incorporating those pieces. And I do think that it's important because I think it can be disregarded. Um, and I really want people to see these as pinatas because um, I have a lot of respect for the medium. And the next slide shows where I go even further um, with the hybridity of, of um, the pieces. So this is my, uh, I made an illuminated page myself um, where I just stripped all the information and imagery and added my own. So it's uh, emojis with um, party, um, you know, like balloons, ice cream, candy, 
as well as the little devil. And also within that is my um, version of David conquering the big pinata beast. And then I also included these hybrids. And again, I just wanted to further push that um, hybridity of, um, or the idea that they are. Oh, if you can go back just one for one second. So this is something where, um, this is actually what spurred the next slide, which is my illuminated hybrid series. So um, after I created these two images on the, uh, the pinata itself, then I extracted those. So it was a little bit meta. So instead of me taking them from the illuminated manuscript, I took it for my own work. Um, and so that was the idea that spurred this illuminated hybrid series. And again, that just speaks to my mixed race uh, background as well, but also further pushing um, this idea that these definitely are pinatas and incorporating um, that motif doesn't negate uh, the value of it. So then we'll talk about birds. Birds you don't really see a lot, uh, or I don't exhibit them a lot. They're mainly commissions in my world. Uh, but it, again, it's a way to practice with fringe and um, and play with form and gesture. And it's it's a, also just a great way for me to make money. Um, so the next slide will show, like uh, I usually do these in groups. So these are a group of blackbirds in San Antonio. And then the next group are Texas birds. And those are in Houston and also one little butterfly. And I also do individual birds. I think the next one is a yeah, brown pelican. And that one's scaled down. It's probably 14 inches high. Um, and that's in San Francisco, I believe. Um, but what this has done is it's kind of working with birds so much has kind of spurred me to open up two other um, uh, series. So this one is this, these two birds um, are from my birder series. So it's a uh, playful way to um, display same-sex couples, basically, uh, using birds. So with birds, birds, um, some of them are sexually dimorphic, meaning male and female are, they have a different plumage. So if you knew birds, you would know that these two birds are two male cardinals. And if you knew behavior of birds, you would know that the feeding is a courting, um, uh, courting act. So um, if you're in the know, you know that these are two, uh, two male cardinals courting one another. Um, but if somebody else thought they would just see them as pretty birds, which I, I like the subversiveness of that. And then the next slide is another bird series. Um, not all birds are sexually dimorphic. Some male and female look the same. So um, I am taking those birds and kind of creating uh, mixed versions and creating a half breed series. So again, speaking to my uh, mixed race background. Um, very quickly, because I know we're very uh, short on time. Um, so those are the two series that I'm working on now. And I believe the next slide is the, oh, okay. I also have an abstract series that I'm working on. Um, this is inspired by Ken Price. He is a ceramicist from Southern California. I think he passed away in 2012. But um, again, it's like taking somebody's technique and trying to translate it to something completely different. With his ceramics, he would create the ceramics, paint them, and then sand them down. And it would create this, um, these little spots of multicolors. Um, so I did the same thing just with uh, cutting away to reveal the color underneath. But he had very, he used very organic um, or created very organic forms, which I'm really into. And so this is just kind of um, an homage to his work. And then lastly, I believe lastly, um, I've been working uh, to 3D scan my work. And um, so I really want to get into the um, realm of AR, augmented reality, and take these pinatas from the gallery and the museum and put them into the street, literally. So that's me. <laughs> Lovely, incredible. Thank you so much, Roberto. Sure. Um, and for managing to pair all of that down into, into short. I tried. <laughs> There's a lot to explore. I also invite Justin to come back on with us. Um, and for any of you who have questions, please feel free to type those um, into the chat or the Q&A. We have one question from Carol Ventura for Roberto about the kind of paper that you use. And is oh, sure. Yeah, you know, when I first started, I was very traditional. It was just party streamers. Um, and I was aware of this like very fancy Italian paper, but it seemed a little, I don't know, I, I didn't want to like shift out of, of the tradition. Um, but after learning about the history of the pinata and how it traveled through Italy, 
to me, I, I uh, thought that was a touchback to its history. So I did switch. So it's a, it's a pretty thick crate paper. It's uh, the company's Carto Technica Rossi in Italy, but they have an outlet in San Diego. It's called Carte Fini, C-A-R-T-E-F-I-N-I. What about you, Justin, um, in terms of materials? Which um, I buy whatever is the cheapest in bulk on Paper Mart <laughs> or whatever distributor. Uh, usually, I think the brand I usually use is Satin Wrap, which is just like the most popular, just regular tissue paper that can be bought in, in big reams. Yeah. Um, question from Saxon Martinez. How do you both feel about uh, what your work is doing to change the perceptions of pinatas and contemporary art? Both started to delve into this, but um, I think there's a lot more that you can add. Do you want to go first, Justin? Um, sure. I mean, I, I decided years ago that I was going to stop worrying about um, like the, the questions about like the ephemeral nature of the work and um, kind of like the the importance of the work because of the material. And so, um, I mean, I've had the privilege of showing at a lot of like big institutions. And so like, I don't, um, as far as like validating the medium, I don't need anybody to validate it. Like it's already, it's already, it's already happening, right? Uh, yeah. People are just late to it. Um, and so I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like, um, you know, all art is valid. And also that there's just this obsession about everything lasting forever. And so whenever somebody asks me like, well, how long is this painting gonna last? I always say, well, how long are you gonna last? Like just buy yeah. it and enjoy it in your house. Like. Yeah, yeah, there's and there's also something yeah. there's also something about seeing it change. I don't know why people yeah. don't enjoy that. Like I live with my pieces and they fade and it's fascinating. Yeah, and like it, I, the the paintings for example, I used to make them like um I kind of related to what you said Roberto about like uh, like having to use the exact materials that are used in piñata. That was kind of my thing in the beginning. So when I made mm -hmm. my canvases, I made them out of cardboard and paper mache them. Now I make them out of board just because, um, okay. uh, just because they, they I, you know, it prevents warping when they travel, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, but to that point, I, I was given so much grief about using cardboard for some, so long. And then I took a trip to Europe. I went to the to the Picasso Museum um, in Paris, and half of those damn paintings are on cardboard. So don't I tell know. me I can't make my work on cardboard. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, yeah. yeah, that that is a frustration. I would say you know you see different artists using your materials that are more volatile than yes. than, than we use, and there are no questions. Um, sometimes I feel like that's a I feel like when there are questions about um, pinata, I feel like there are racial undertones um, where they don't want to accept it as valuable. Or, or they stop, they, they just see it as a pinata and don't look further into, yeah. don't investigate further into the work because of the materials or maybe because of the aesthetic of it. Like when I did that show at the Denver Art Museum, I remember somebody coming up to me and telling me like, I really love your piece because it's the one that's, it's the only installation that's not political in the show. And I was like, oh God, oh, no. <laughs> you don't get what I'm trying to say. Okay, yeah. noted, I got to do better next time, you know? Question actually, yeah, about the installations there and at Eamon Carter, were they able to preserve any of it? Um, I don't think they kept anything, um, actually, Maybe there's a few pieces from the Denver Art Museum that were saved from the exhibition, but most of the most of the work is destroyed. Uh, some places that have a lot of storage will keep some of it. For example, the National National Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque. I did a big mural there, and they were able to save it because they have a really good size vault. Mm. So I think it just depends on the institution. Mm. Well, I think also Maggie kept a piece of yours. I think I saw that on her wall at Eamon Carter. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Um, At least a small yeah. piece would say. Yeah, usually if I if they don't collect a big piece, they'll they'll get us 
of the you know if they don't keep the big mural they'll get a you know we'll work on a print project together like right now i have a, a print project going with the des moines art center and i also uh the yeah the ammon carter bought a print for me as well great um let's see we have a question from luis rodriguez uh you were explaining justin your Mexican Guatemalan American identity. And he's wondering if you can tell us a bit more about how your work's been received in Mexico. Um, I'm curious from, from Roberto as well, if the, there's been a Mexican reception of your work and do people read your work in a similar way than a US audience might? Um, well, that's a great question. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I don't, I've shown my work in Mexico a few times, uh, specifically like in Puebla, Mexico City, like where I've done a lot of my research and stuff. Um, and I think the only reason the work has shown is because of the art historical references to Velasco, right? So it was kind of a show about that or around those ideas. Um, but I, I, to answer that question uh, um, with a with a, an example, when I first did a big residency at this place called Arquitopia in, in Puebla, um, a lot of the work that I was doing was sculptural. It was before I started making those landscape paintings. And so I thought how, um, I thought it would be fun to make uh, these big piñatas and put them out in the streets and like the, in, in El Centro Historico in the historical district of Puebla, right? And I started hanging these like piñatas that were references to the churches or the, the convent that I was obsessed with or whatever. And I realized immediately like, oh, I'm just putting, I'm putting up piñatas in Mexico. Like nobody sees this, like nobody <laughs> cares. <laughs> so that really made me think of like, oh, the context that this work just looked at. But also just to say like, um, because of the way that, of, because of the way that Mexican culture or Latinx culture, Central American culture, whatever, has been, um, uh, has been distributed, you know, has been, uh, uh, not distributed, but, uh, represented. Commodified. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> like, uh, when I showed my work in the UK, for example, like, people got it immediately because they're like, oh, I've seen this in movies, you know, but like mm -hmm. in Mexico or even in places like LA, like this has only been like my second time I've ever showed in LA. It's because they're like, why do we want piñata artists here? There's piñatas everywhere, <laughs> you know? So um, it's this it's this very um, interesting dynamic that I notice even within the United States. Uh, like I show a lot in Texas, I show a lot in the Midwest, I show a lot on the East Coast, and I think it's because uh, um, this kind of work is maybe not dismissed in those areas, if that makes any sense. Would you agree, Roberto? I would. You know, I live in L.A., and I only recently, um, so thank you, Emily, been able to show in L.A. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't say I have a finger on the pulse as to why. Yeah. Um, um, and I, I've never shown in Mexico, so I, I can't really speak to um, how they would receive my work there. But I will say, like most people that see my illuminated manuscript work, they they see alebrijes as soon as they see them. You know, yeah. and most people think that's what I'm making. We've had a lot of comments along those lines. Yeah. So that makes sense. Um, okay, we are already at 12, after 12.20. Um, I think we will probably con conclude here. I do want to mention to everybody, if anyone did have additional questions for Yang or, or for Roberto and Justin, happy to um, connect you. Just reach out to us, um, center at craftinamerica.org, and we will go from there. There were a lot of different angles mentioned in this presentation today. So, so many ways to go with, um, with the study of piñatas as an art form. So um, thank you to you both for what you are doing to push this forward.